Assalamu alaikum. I'm Imam Dai Abdella, the director of LGBT Outreach Program at Muslims for Progressive Values. In this video, we are going to talk about our understanding of gender issues in the Muslim community, especially how these changes have taken place in different periods. When we look at the religious experience of Jewish, Christian, and Muslim women in these various communities, what we recognize immediately is that there is a lot of influences both internally and externally that affect these women's lives. We're going to look at how these influences have led to changing environments in these women's lives. By focusing on the experiences of Muslim women in different stages of Islamic history, we're going to see how these influences, whether immediate or broad, have continued. In Judaism, when it comes to gender, there is a clear equality between the sexes. However, that doesn't mean they are the same. For example, in the biblical period, the man was the public face of the family. The woman, on the other hand, was the private face of the family. We can see that by just looking at Jewish identity, which is based on the mother, versus Jewish leadership, which was mostly through the males in the sense that the majority of the prophets were men. In Christianity, things got a little more complicated because the female was the mother of God. This moved the women from the private family to the religious center. Therefore, in Christianity, you might see more images of women in the holy spaces. Nevertheless, because Christianity is a combination of different cultures, women were still facing different challenges in equality. Now in Islam, things are even more complicated because the first believer, as well as the first wife of Prophet Muhammad, happened to be an independent businesswoman named Khadija. This led to women having more participation in the growing of the new faith. As an example, Aisha, another wife of the Prophet, ended up influencing the new religion far more than any other man. Of course, as time went on and more and more cultures came into Islam, we end up seeing the diversity of all of these unique cultures influencing the lives of Muslim women. During the Islamic Golden Age, we see women transformed from the pioneers of early Islam into a position more like their Jewish cousins. For example, in the early Islamic Golden Age, we see women like Rabia Bashri, who happened to be educated and was a scholar in her own right. Unfortunately, as this age continued, we see less and less of those types of women. Now, of course, that doesn't mean Muslim women lost their basic rights, the kind of rights that their Judo-Christian sisters would not have for more than a thousand years. These rights included the right to own a business, the right to divorce, the right to challenge men in court, as well as the right to be a witness. However, they ended up losing more and more in terms of education, scholarship, and political power. That doesn't mean that there weren't powerful women during that time. For example, we talked about the openly gay Caliph Al-Amin. But what we didn't discuss was his mother. His mother, Zubaydah, was a powerful Arab woman who was literally fighting to keep political power from the Persians through the half-brother of her son. What this tells us is that if you happen to find yourself in an elite family, you are better off as a woman. In modern times, which is from the last 250 years, several things deteriorated for women in the Muslim community. Of course, that has to do with many different factors. Let's first look at how the colonization of the Muslims led to the legal changes of women's rights in Muslim societies. For example, if you happen to be the British Empire and you just colonized a Muslim nation such as Somalia, you are then going to force your own laws about women on that community. However, because the British Empire was systematically smart, they always struck a more compromised deal with their local Muslims 
by stating that they were only after the general laws, but that they didn't mind that Muslim women could still practice the basic rights afforded to them under their faith in their communities. This, of course, allowed the women of those times to be able to continue their lives with little or no changes by working, owning businesses, voting, being a witness, and many other legal rights in the community without raising any issues with the colonizer. For example, there is a system of financial means for women in the Somali community. This system, which is a financial or banking system, is regulated and controlled by women even though this system was against the law at face value. This system called Ayutu is a system that allows poor and rich women in the Muslim Somali community to gain from each other. For example, if you happen to be a poor mother and you want to borrow some money, you borrow against your future financial contributions by working with these women. So let's say, for example, you want to borrow $100,000. This means you would have to pay the money back within a certain number of years. You would have to join an Ayutu system for maybe 10 years, allowing you to contribute a $10,000 annual contribution each year for the next 10 years. On the other hand, you just qualified for $100,000 to start a business, own a house, or do whatever else you wanted to do with it. This type of legal right were not available to non-Muslim women under colonialism. Of course, Muslim women were denied political power, but it doesn't mean there weren't political women. For example, there were politically powerful women such as Hurim Sultana, also known as Roxiliana, who had Suleiman the Magnificent's eldest son executed for treason to secure the future rule of her own son. This means Muslim women were working behind the scenes in some societies. Of course, that made space for future Muslim women in some of these cultures to find power. In the 20th century in several Muslim countries such as Pakistan, they have had female heads of state long before the United States and other developed countries have had theirs. Based upon what we have learned of these three different periods, we can see that Muslim women's lives from an early period to the modern times have faced different challenges. This gives Muslim women in the present a lot of information to draw upon in order to plead their cases as faithfuls in the community. Despite all the external influences, Muslim women can regain their statuses by referring to the rich Islamic history that relates to gender equality.